This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today I want to talk about Bitcoin, Monero, and 51% attacks. And today's video is a follow-up to yesterday's video, which was going into detail about how 51% attacks work. So make sure you watch that video before watching this video if you want a little bit more background. In that video, we discuss things that you can do if you're a mining pool and control a lot of the hash rate, in other words, the network computational power of a proof-of-work coin like Bitcoin or Monero. Some of the attacks you can do, you can do block withholding. This is where the malicious mining pool mines a block, and then rather than sending the block out to the rest of the network and all the nodes instead starts mining the next block on top of it in an attempt to get a head start and thus win the next block. If they control enough hash, they can do this for multiple blocks. Then there's the empty block attack. This can also be executed by withholding blocks, as we just talked about. Malicious mining pool then tries to mine a series of empty blocks in a row, none of which contain transactions. And as long as this is going on, users will not be able to send or receive transactions. In other words, this is a, basically a DOS attack, a denial of service attack. But the mining pool, even under these conditions, will still be earning the block subsidy of 3.125 Bitcoin. They won't be earning transaction fees because the blocks are empty, but they'll still be making, call it $350,000, $360,000 every block, which they can then use to help pay for the mining equipment and electricity that's being used in the attack. And then we have what we talked about in the previous video. We talked about their so-called double spending attacks and block reorg attacks. Here's one way that would work. For example, you buy a large ticket item like a car with Bitcoin, you drive the car off the lot, and then you get your malicious mining pool to remine the block that contained that transaction in which you paid the car dealer. And now you have both a car and you have your original Bitcoin since the transaction got mined out of the chain or basically the block that was it, it was in, it no longer exists. A block reorg is when one or more blocks gets removed from the blockchain because a longer blockchain has been created. A malicious mining pool can attempt any of these attacks, but they only really make sense for a mining pool that controls a lot of the computational power, a lot of the hash rate of the network. Now, why is this? It's because a mining pool's control over block production is directly related to how much hash it controls. So for example, if a mining pool controls 30% of the network's hash rate, it will mine 30% of the blocks on average. If it controls 51% of the network's hash rate, it will mine 51% of the blocks on average. And once you control a majority of the hash rate, this is where we get that 51% attack number, once you control a majority of the hash rate, things get really interesting. As Paul Lamb pointed out in a comment from yesterday's video, you missed a really important aspect of one entity controlling 51% of the global hash rate. They gain the ability to write 100% of the blocks, not 51% of them. All they have to do is broadcast their blocks to the network, ignore all blocks mined by anyone else, and only build on top of their own blocks. With this strategy, since they control a majority of the hash rate, their chain will be the heaviest. From a profit perspective, they would earn 100% of block rewards, as we were just talking about, and quickly drive most of the competition into bankruptcy. From a political perspective, they would gain unbreakable censorship power because the mining pool gets to decide which transactions get included in a block. A hard fork changing the hashing algorithm, what's called the nuclear option, would be the only recourse. And this would be where we switch Bitcoin's proof of work from SHA-256 to another hash algorithm. But in doing so, it would basically make all the ASICs, all the mining rigs all around the world worthless because the only thing they do is SHA-256 hashes. So then they'd be forced to, to mine Bcash or BSV or some, some lesser coin. And what would in fact happen is those would decline even more if something happened to Bitcoin. So these, these mining rigs would basically be useless at that point. So that is the sort of the last, the final resort that nodes have. If miners behave very badly, they can say, okay, we're just going to break all your machines by changing, changing the mining algorithm. So then we comes to the question that's been in the recent news of this week. Did Monero recently experience a 51% attack? And, and my conclusion, and I think you'll probably agree now that you have this background, is not really. What it actually experienced was a series of large block reorganizations, reorgs, that seemed to be ongoing. So this was published by Cubic, which is the attacker. This shows that these blocks were remined. And so the, basically the chain ends here and all these blocks were replaced with the blocks on the right side. And this was the, the block reorg that happened. There was another one that happened as starting at block height 3,475,995 and went all the way to 3,476,001. Uh, and we can see that basically these, these blocks that were mined by Nanopool were remined by an unknown actor. And then the 
the uh, chain continued. So this is Monero consensus.info. You can monitor these things here. And after that, that last reorg, we had 320 blocks without any reorgs. And then Cubic's been putting out stuff on their X account, uh, announcing, uh, and we have to take all this with a grain of salt, obviously. Cubic has reached over 51% of Monero's hash rate, effectively giving it control of the network. Cubic chose not to launch the takeover yet, proving a powerful theory by action. And then they posted some, some uh, statistics to show that they, at this point, at least when they took the snapshot, if they're telling the truth here, they controlled 52.36% of the hash. Their pool had a hash rate of 2.8 giga hashes per second. And then the total hash rate of the network at the time of the snapshot was 5.34 giga hashes per second. Again, this is taken from their website and we don't have access to this. I believe they may have turned off the API or however you access this data. So people are guessing a little bit now is what I understand. If you're finding this video helpful so far, I'll just pause really briefly here to ask you to help to support this channel's educational mission. Hit the subscribe button. That does really help the channel. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video, and share this video with a friend or family member. So Cubic may have controlled 51% or more of the hash rate for a very brief period of time. And I think it's also quite likely that they cherry picked this screenshot of the hash rate. They picked a series of blocks over which they would have this share of the hash rate. It's quite likely that Cubic is unable to sustain this sort of 51% attack. And now the Monero community is rallying around Monero to support it by running a benevolent pool. At least that's what it looks like to me. Uh, support XMR, support Monero. Dot com, which was number one in the hash last time I checked, but it looks like right now it's number two in terms of hash rates, uh, pools arranged by hash rates. Now, if this were a real and sustained 51% attack on Monero by Cubic, we would expect to see many more and deeper reorgs, and we would also be seeing almost every single block or every single block mined by the attacker, mined by the Cubic mining pool, which has clearly not been happening. Now, is this because Cubic is unable to do it at this point in time? Probably, but there appears to be a coordinated social media bot attack underway as well. This was from Sir Jams a lot, pointing out all these posts that look very inorganic and look like they were done by some sort of the attacker, maybe the same attacker. Then this re leads to the question, is this a state level or intel agency level attack on Monero? Maybe, though it's impossible to know for sure. I, per I personally think the Monero is much less of a threat to the system than Bitcoin. But Monero people will, of course, disagree. I think the advantage Bitcoin has is the Trojan horse that has been led into the system, whereas Monero uh, is still outside the city walls. It's been delisted from so many exchanges, and it still has such a small market cap that it's pretty hard for it to have an impact on the global financial system and on central banks like Monero is having. Now, this could also be nothing more than a publicity stunt by Cubic, this 51% attack or block reorgs. This could be nothing more than a publicity stunt by Cubic to gain attention and pump their crappy coin. They seem to have a token associated with this, and they seem to have plans to permanently take over Monero mining. But I think that's likely a bluff. They put out a couple press releases, which I'll link to in the description notes below. I wanted to highlight two comments from them. The first one, the team has decided, this is Cubic speaking, the team has decided not to take over the protocol's consensus for the moment because of internal discussions on whether that would hurt Monero's price. And Monero's price has been suffering even in this bull market because of this attack. Then they go on to write, with the takeover test now complete, Again, this is, this is their propaganda perhaps, uh, but it could be true, I suppose. With the takeover test now complete, the Monero network's core functionality remains intact. Its privacy, speed, and usability have not been compromised. However, the end goal for the Monero protocol security to be provided, the end goal is for the Monero protocol security to be provided by Cubic's miners. This way, the rewards would be funneled through Cubic's pools, bringing higher profitability and creating a new higher incentive landscape for Monero miners. Now, if this were to actually happen, this would be a complete takeover of Monero's security mechanism and consensus mechanism by Cubic, in which case they would be controlling all of the mining for the block, uh, for the for the blockchain, for the network. In that case, you'd have a, a huge problem because Cubic would be in charge of what goes into every block. And so you could have huge censorship and this would be very bad for Monero. That being said, I don't think this is what's going to happen. I don't think they do control uh, a, a huge chunk of the hash rate. Maybe they control 30, 35%, but they're, I don't think they're anywhere near a sustained 51% of the hash rate. Again, that's just my opinion. We'll see what happens. Here's the thing though, even if Cubic is lying about their hash power, their lies have the potential to weaken Monero if enough people 
believe Cubic and then dump their Monero and or stop mining Monero. If they stop mining Monero, then Cubic gets a larger percentage of the total hash and then their attack could really uh, go a little bit further. So I'll put a link to both these in the description notes below. The block had an interesting take on this. Reminder, Cubic uses a different model. They call it useful proof of work, sort of a jab at proof of work. It's kind of silly. Cubic uses a useful proof of work model that incentivizes CPU mining of Monero's RandomX algorithm. So Monero, instead of using SHA-256, uses RandomX for its hashing algorithm. And the thing is about Monero is you can still mine Monero using a CPU or a GPU which in this case turns out to be probably a negative thing, as we'll talk about in a moment. But this is basically what they do. Cubic tries to incentivize miners and then converts the Monero that's been mined. They convert it to USDT, the US dollar uh, tether stablecoin, and they use USDT to buy and burn Cubic tokens, thus pumping the price of Cubic. And this is at least work for them. It says from mid-May to late July, Cubic's share of Monero's global hash rate has surged from under 2% to above 25% at times topping the pool rankings before dropping back after community backlash and that, that benevolent mining pool that we talked about. So what are some takeaways from this attack? We've just been thinking about 51% attacks and block reorgs for the last couple of days. Takeaway number one, smaller proof of work chains like Monero are more subject to hash rate attacks than larger proof of work chains like Bitcoin. And this is another reason that people prefer to use Bitcoin over Monero because you have a much lower chance of this sort of thing happening, though it's a non-zero probability as we'll see in a moment. But smaller proof of work chains are much more vulnerable to this. That's because to attack larger chains like Bitcoin, you need much more equipment and you need ungodly amounts of electricity compared to Monero. We've seen lots of actual 51% attacks on small chains, small market cap chains like BSV, uh, ETH Classic, ETC, and others over the years, while Bitcoin has never, ever had a 51% attack. As Nikita Zavronikov points out here, uh, he, has a good, he or she has a good list here of, um, of 51% attacks on other coins, all the way from Ravencoin to BSV to Fyro, Verge, some of these I've never heard of, but I'll put a link to this in the description notes below. Takeaway number two, Monero's attempt to exclude ASIC miners, which is how Bitcoin is mined these days. These are these are miners that just do one thing. Uh, the chip does just one thing and does it very well. It's a highly specialized chip, unlike a CPU or a GPU. But Monero's attempt to exclude these kind of ASIC miners may not have been the smartest idea. idea. They programmed Monero to make it what they call ASIC resistance. But this turns out this could be a problem because it's much easier to rent a bunch of CPUs or GPUs to attack Monero, as we've seen has been happening this week with Cubic, than it is to collect enough ASICs to attack the Bitcoin network. CPUs are everywhere, SHA-256 ASIC machines are not. And this was something I was warning Monero about back in April of 2023. So I'll put a link to this video in the description notes below. I've actually done a, a good amount of videos on Monero. Takeaway number three, it's tempting to mock Monero for what's happened, but we really need to take the log out of our own eyes first. And I would say too, I, I do like the Monero community. They're very freedom minded, minded, they're very interested in privacy, and they do many of these things better than a lot of Bitcoiners or most Bitcoiners. Unfortunately, I do think Monero people are focused on the wrong coin. I don't think XMR has a future, and I think it will continue to decline against Bitcoin. But I do like a lot of the Monero people, and I like their their sort of uh, and, and cap uh, or libertarian approach to things and their interest in privacy. So this is definitely not meant to attack those people and I hope more of them will come over and leaven the loaf that is Bitcoin, uh, which is, seems to be much more focused now on Bitcoin treasury companies and things that don't really matter as much. But again, we probably shouldn't mock Monero because currently one of the biggest unresolved problems in Bitcoin today is mining pool centralization which is of course a prerequisite for all the kinds of attacks that we've been discussing yesterday and today. And if we look at Bitcoin mining pools, it's highly, highly concentrated still, though Ocean is, is making an impact and slowly growing, but we have Foundry at 26, 27%. And then we have all these Chinese pools. When you add them up, they're probably pretty close to 40%. So Bitcoin mining is highly centralized because of mining pool centralization. And it would be quite easy for Foundry at, what did we say, 26.71% of the hash to do something similar to Bitcoin if they wanted to. It wouldn't be a 51% attack because they don't control that much hash, but they could cause a lot of problems 
What's stopping them? Well, what's stopping the main thing that's stopping them is economic incentives. They're in the business of mining, and so they they don't want to kill the host that makes it uh, makes it possible for them to mine. If Foundry the mining pool attacks Bitcoin, another thing that could happen is the miners, the hashers who have the actual mining rigs. Uh, may choose to point their machines to another mining pool. So these mining pools are not physical things. They're basically IP addresses that you point hash to. So it's fairly easy to switch. So this is this is at least the game theory that the hashers who run the actual mining rigs may choose to point their machines to another mining pool. That takes just a couple of seconds to change. You just have to change the address you're pointing to. On the other hand, if you're a large KYC regulated Bitcoin mining operation in the US and you're basically forced to use Foundry then because you're forced to use the largest, most regulated pool, it may not be that easy to switch pools in practice. So this game theory may not play out in practice. We could eventually see a situation where Foundry chooses to exclude certain transactions from its blocks. This is what Mara did a couple of years ago, and they got in a lot of trouble for it from Bitcoiners. Mara is always attacking the network, but they were basically censoring transactions for the U.S. government, transactions that the U.S. government didn't like. So we could see something like this happen to Foundry. They're not nearly as bad as Mara. But we could see a situation in coming years where maybe the management changes at Foundry and they choose to exclude and censor certain transactions from their blocks that the U.S. government doesn't like or that they don't like or that their friends don't like. And then the miners still don't defect because they're still making money and they're sort of locked into this KYC situation. That would give the U.S. government a future way of censoring transactions in about 20, what did we say, 26.7% of the blocks. Sensor transactions could still be mined by Chinese mining pools or other pools like Ocean. That's one of the nice things. It seems unlikely that Foundry, a U.S. mining pool, would collude with Chinese mining pools given the geopolitics, though you never know. It looks like the U.S. and China were working on COVID together at Wuhan uh, as a bio a bioweapon. So we could be seeing a lot more cooperation than we otherwise think. Weird things like that could be going on. But hopefully the game theory won't play out that way. What else is stopping Foundry from attacking the Bitcoin network? If the Bitcoin network dies or the price of Bitcoin goes down a lot, that could hurt Foundry's revenues, obviously, and put it out of business. Of course, at some point, if it's maybe the CIA running Foundry or NSA or something, Foundry may end up doing things that are economically irrational, but still rational from the perspective of someone who has a CIA proverbial gun to their head. And then if we get a certain kind of candidate like AOC or a similar, similar socialist moron is elected president in 2028, it wouldn't be unthinkable to see the same problems we had under the Biden administration and see foundry pressure to shut down as an operation or to censor transactions. So to conclude, centralized mining pools are probably the greatest threat to Bitcoin at this point, along with the related problem of node software centralization and spam, which we've been fighting on this channel as well. Ocean Mining and its Datum Protocol are helping to fix this mining pool centralization problem by allowing miners and hashers to build their own block templates so that they get to decide for themselves rather than having Ocean or Foundry or Antpool deciding which transactions get included in a block. And when you mine with Ocean or solo mine using Datum, you get to decide which transactions go into a block for yourself. If you mine with Foundry, of course, then Foundry gets to decide which transactions go into a block, even if you're the one who ends up mining or finding that block. Now, the best way to learn more about Bitcoin mining is to get your hands dirty doing it yourself. You're unlikely, you're unlikely to make a lot of money doing this, but you will learn a lot. And I have a video here that will show you how to mine Bitcoin at home using Datum. And you can either mine with ocean mining, you can mine with a pool, or you can do what's called solo mining or lotto mining, where if you win a block, you'll get paid that 3.125 Bitcoin. So call it $360,000, $370,000. Very unlikely. It's a little bit like winning a state lottery. But the one thing I can guarantee is if you do this, you buy one of these miners, they just cost 100, 150 bucks. You'll have a lot of fun and you'll get a better insight into how mining works. At some point, we may need to be, we may be find ourselves in a similar situation to what Monero found its, itself in, where the network was being attacked and the blockchain was being attacked by a hostile actor. And I do admire how the Monero community came around and form their own pool and tried to contribute hash to fight the attackers. So I think that's another reason it's important for all of us to know how to mine Bitcoin at home if we ever need to get together and defend the network against bad actors like Mara, for example, or other bad actors in a bad political environment. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks all for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.